I'm Ward Cooper, your host on Change Your Voice, Change Your Life. In studio with me is my co-host, Dr. John Curtis, and the title of our presentation, this is part two. Bo- this is Botox in the New York Times. Why are we... Why are we putting that title on the screen? Well, I, I think in your particular field, I think there's a lot of disinformation that's gone on about Botox. So we know there was an article in the New York Times. Just let's, get, let's cut to the chase. Mm. Okay, Donald G. McNeil Jr. published an article in 2003. March 2nd, I believe it is. Okay. That said basically... Front page, New York Times. This is the front page. and it said, it said that Botox is giving patients with spastic vocal cords back their voices. Mm-hmm. And, and you found that statement to be uh, objectionable. More than objectionable, I thought it was inaccurate and didn't qualify or uh, present reservations as to what the outcome of Botox for spastic vocal cords might be. Um, I also was intrigued as to what is the documentation for that statement. And Mr. McNeil uh, Jr. was very kind uh, when I uh, uh, addressed that issue and sent me a, uh, a printout um, a blurb, one page of an article in the Journal of Otology, Rhinology, and Laryngology, uh, which said that uh, he was, and they were treating bilateral cord paralysis, bilateral. Is that, the, is dyspon- that the same as the strangled voice? Yeah, but uh, that's a very exceptional condition, bilateral. Jeff Broad had a surgical procedure. Uh, he's on the Internet. He gives up the right of privacy and confidentiality. And he has bilateral cord paralysis. He talks like this. That's all he has. And we had a, a, a patient uh, who had the surgery uh, from a major medical center. She was on this program, and she has severe impairment of the vocal cords, mm-hmm. and she whispers like this, too. Uh, Jeff Broad is a very wonderful guy. I spoke with him at length by telephone and corresponded with, corresponded, uh, corresponded with him. And he uh, opted for a surgical procedure. He knew about what I'm doing, direct yeah. voice rehab. And he knows about the reports of cures that I have. But he wanted something done to him, not something he's going to work at. So he's the recipient of bilateral cord paralysis. And he has no when you say a recipient, do you mean that medical intervention caused his bilateral cord paralysis? Oh, yeah. So yeah. he did not have his bilateral cord paralysis prior to his surgery? No. But prior to the surgery, what did he have? He had strangled voice, spasmodic dysphonia. Okay. Which they talk like that and so forth. Now, uh, in... Performing a surgery on him, is it the presumption of the medical community that spasmodic dysphonia is a neurological condition? Absolutely. That dates back to 1960 with Roe, Brumlick, and Moore, where they found uh, some of their cases of 10 spasmodic dysphonic cases had spiking in the brain. And they didn't understand, from my perspective, that spiking in the brain, as with stuttering, can be caused by effortful speech. When you're talking like this, and if you look at stutters, you'll see they're doing that. They have eye spasms, neck spasms, back spasms, and they have strangled, strained uh, speech. The same is true of spasmodic dysphonia. So I ran uh, the stutters group at Stanford in 1957 as a director of adult stutters, and I saw that. And then later on I realized that uh, it's not a neurological condition that they have because uh, we've, we had uh, one of the best uh, outcomes at Stanford University they ever had in speech pathology with stutters. The eye spasms stopped the neck spasms, and they could, uh, in a uh, good part, talk normally. Well, they weren't using Botox back then. No, they weren't stutters. using Botox. But then. didn't subsequently, after it was introduced to the field of speech, uh, pathology, uh, weren't they actually applying Botox to stutters? Yes, they were. Uh, Bo- uh, Botox was brought to the field of uh, uh, spasmodic dysphonia by Mitchell F. Brin, a neurologist, a well-intentioned, very bright, brilliant guy, um, humanitarian, uh, compassionate. And that's what I find very interesting. Uh, the best and the brightest in the medical community are very compassionate, humanitarian, and well-intentioned. My uh, take on all they're doing with Botox is, uh, intervening uh, to help patients with spasmodic dysphonia is on the wrong road. They never have one single cure ever mm. with all medical intervention dating back to Traub in 1871 who characterized spasmodic dysphonia as nervous hoarseness. Do you know why he, he characterized it as nervous hoarseness? If you talk like that and you're strangling. People take you as being nervous and you come across as nervous and you're feared like Hannibal Lecter. So spasmodic so there's a lot of patients and, and sort of spasming you the know, face, the eyes, the neck. Symptom of the mm. strain that is related to trying to cough out speech 
or produce speech mm. in which uh, somebody is simultaneously strangling themselves. Yeah. And yet the medical profession viewed this as a psychiatric condition from 1871 all the way through at least 1960. And still, it's still... And even it's, today, it's, I know it's, that you've mentioned one of your great admired colleagues that you have. Mm -hmm. And I think you do mm -hmm. esteem him. Yeah. His name is Dr. Arnie Aronson. Yeah, he's an icon Clinic. in the field. He's on the wrong road. I told him okay. that for years. He said to me that he's been... I, if I'm correct, and I, I'm open to correction, he said that he's been on the wrong road in, uh, in looking at spasmodic dysphonia for 35 years. I've been reporting cures of spasmodic dysphonia for 35 but years. But he, he also believes... not... He wasn't in agreement. He is now... Um, he also believes that there's a, what's called a psychogenic mm -hmm. variety of spasmodic dysphonia, because I've mm -hmm. talked to him via email, mm -hmm. and um, he's of the belief that the patients that you've treated have been only and the ones for whom you have received your cures or the mm -hmm. major recoveries have been those with psychogenic. Can you comment about that? In I'm not Dr. a psychiatrist. I don't Do you treat only psychogenic no, spasmodic I disorder? No, I, I don't treat psychogenic. Then why does he refer to you as treating those patients? Well, let's say he's on the wrong road again. He's, got, he's misdefining what I'm doing. He doesn't believe or did not believe. Now he's, he's changed his position. He uh, didn't believe that I could cure neurological SD, and neurological SD is what he wrote for the uh, Reverend James Johnson 20 years ago, saying that this patient who had spasmodic dysphonia had neurological spasmodic dysphonia. I helped cure James Johnson, the, the Reverend James Johnson, in one month of intensive therapy, and he's remained cured for 20 years. Now, why do now you I had it was Dr. Ani Aronson, uh, if what? I could pick that yeah. up, call, call the Reverend James Johnson, finally, after 20 years, and now in the email, uh, Arnie Aronson, who's a colleague of mine, I esteem him very, uh, very much, um, has said that the Reverend Johnson is perfect. He was most severe. We've played the severity of James Johnson. <laughs> so he's changing his position. I am of uh, the view and mine that I cannot cure a neurological position, a neurological strangled voice. That's what I was getting at, is when you referred to the diagnosis of Reverend Johnson as neurological SD. By Arnie Aronson on the You were Mayo only Clinic referring to that for record. the purpose of distinguishing the label, distinguishing it from the label of psychogenic MD. Absolutely. But you don't necessarily agree that there is such a thing as neurological SD. A case here and there. I think they're on the, the wrong road. They've misdiagnosed of cases, it. What's that? You believe that the vast majority of cases are not neurological. They're all basically functional, which means they're talking in the wrong voice. All spasmodic dysphonia, Dr. Gerald Burke, UCLA, uh, head and neck division, chairman of that division, says that SD is in the lowest throat. He is correct. He's absolutely correct. Where they're incorrect is that they're saying it's a dystonia neurological yeah. problem and it can't be changed. I can change the so-called neurological problem in seconds or minutes. I do that uh, um, at meetings. I do it uh, at, um, at uh, presentations for the American Speech and Hearing Association playing the tape. I, do, I can change voices on Larry King, Oprah, and so forth uh, that are failing. Uh, and get them to sound right. The, the key is not to get the right voice. I can do that quite quickly in seconds. Uh, is to get them to use that voice ongoingly. Uh, the Wall Street Journal interviewed me in 1980 saying I'm a miraculous uh, voice doctor, citing Norton Simon. I, I helped him get his voice back after he, he was losing it for 35 years going from one doctor to another. I thought that was very simple. It took a period of maybe four or five months to get him acquainted with his right voice. And the same thing is true of those with spasmodic dysphonia as with stuttering. It took a year to change the stutters, the adult stutters at Stanford University and getting accolades from uh, Virgil Anderson, the director of speech pathology there, saying uh, it's one of the best job or the best job in the history of Stanford, which was nice. But the Botox voice has been used for stuttering. It was a rage. It came and went. It's off the radar screen. You don't hear of it anymore mm -hmm. because it didn't work. The Botox voice for spasmodic dysphonia is pushed by the New York Times, March 2nd, uh, 2003, and they're, they're absolutely enthralled by the Botox voice. And what's the statement by the New York Times on the Sunday edition front page? Well, that Botox is giving patients with spastic vocal cords back their voices. The question is what kind of voices are they getting back? Well, there, no, the question is why the author of, or the reporter who made the statement 
will not give you a reference mm. for how we came up with that statement. You have a, a, uh, a letter here from the New York Times, so we mm. can show this mm -hmm. to the audience here. Mm. And this letter is a response to simply wanting to have a accurate source of the statement that Botox is giving patients back uh, with spastic vocal cords back their voices. Now, here's what Cochran said to you. This is, this is the editor. Who? This is David Cochran, from the assistant science editor. He said here that I've gone back and read the article. The reference to Botox as therapy for spastic vocal cords was passing, and as far as I can tell, not inaccurate. Now, did you bring to his attention that Botox as therapy for spastic vocal cords, was that your statement that you asked him no, to investigate? No, I wasn't concerned with that. I was concerned with who was the source that gave Donald G. McNeil, Jr. The, that statement. The writer of the article. Yeah. yeah. Where is the expertise, the background that qualifies Donald G. McNeil, Jr. to make that statement? He's a general make writer. He's a very good writer. That statement that Botox is giving patients with spastic vocal cords back their That's voices. That's right. I want to know who Why sourced them. Why did Cochran respond to that particular statement. He's an editor. Yes. Now, here's part of the problem we have today. We have a difficulty getting over the New York Times <laughs> right now. The, the big one that blew off, I, I think, uh, blew the, the whole cover off the New York Times is Jason Blair. Mm -hmm. He was actually outright fabricating things. Mm -hmm. Now we're finding some very in interesting kinds of reporting that goes mm -hmm. on there. You've brought to the attention in the Science Times mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. uh, with uh, this uh, statement that you can't get a source on and you've tried numerous times in different ways and you still can't get uh, an idea who sourced the statement that Botox is giving patients back their vocal cords. I couldn't even get a documentation yeah. that is meaningful, that's accurate, uh, from Donald G. McNeil, Jr. But you know Jr. that Judith McNeil... Uh, I Ju want to just Judith follow Miller. through. I asked, what is the documentation? Yeah. Uh, two questions I asked. What is the documentation for that statement? And uh, Donald G. McNeil, Jr. was very kind in giving me a 2002 report from the Journal of Ortology, Rhinology, and Laryngology that had nothing to do with that statement. Nothing. It also had nothing to do with spasmodic dysphonia or... No, it had it because the statement that he gave me from a journal, that journal, was talking about bilateral cord paralysis. Overwhelmingly, those with spastic vocal cords and strangled voices do not have bilateral cord paralysis. That's an exception such an exception it's basically off the radar screen and that statement that that blurb from the 2002 that he uh, faxed to me saying that that is my documentation has nothing to do with, with what he said well okay well, let's go and then he won't give me the source the source of who the gave him the statement first if i asked for the documentation who's the which source is irrelevant for yeah now Here's, here's a question. You've got uh, Judith Miller, who is writing. She's in the head of, she's in the, the, the heart right now mm. of this, the whole center of the controversy related to the outing of the CIA agent Valerie Plain that may bring down Dick Cheney, Karl Rove, Scooter Libby, the, the uh, chief of staff for Dick Cheney. It could take down the entire White House, and it could even take down President Bush. Now, he, and, and, and Judith Miller is at the heart of this, being the veteran reporter for the New York Times, that Maureen Dowd, who's a syndicated columnist for the New York Times, is now reporting that uh, she's run amok over there. He's talking about Miller. About Judith Miller. Now, yeah. what she's referring to in running amok is that basically because of her sources that she would not disclose, she went to jail. Mm -hmm. Now, McNeil Jr. has not gone to jail for failing to reveal a source to you mm -hmm. because you're not a grand jury mm -hmm. and you're not a U.S. attorney. Now, They but, fluffed me off. But the here's, the par guys. here's the parallel between the two. Mm -hmm. Miller wouldn't reveal her source either for the numerous articles that she had written mm. on weapons of mass destruction, the basis of which 2,000 Americans have now died in Iraq, mm. and another 2,000 in the next two years will wind up dying if something isn't done, as a result of her using the New York Times to lend credibility to the uh, story that Saddam Hussein was a danger dangerous map mess, uh, uh, it, a menace with weapons of mass destruction. Now, the New York Times has also done it in one your One of those field. weapons was botulinum botulism or botulism toxin, yeah. which kills 100 to 200,000 people with a thumbnail of that substance undiluted. Uh, now, and, now uh, here's the um, parallel to your situation. The parallel is that equally false, misleading, and inaccurate 
uh, and unsourced and undocumented information mm -hmm. has now been disseminated off the front page to uh, untold numbers of people who may be suffering from this condition mm -hmm. who after reading this article would run out and get Botox treatments. Why not? This is, a, this is such a, an endorsement, blithely made, without sourcing, without documentation, that it to me is mind-boggling as to why it's, and it's uh, an absurdity that I'm looking at. That's me clinically. But what is the reality? Why am I talking about this when people don't understand what Botox for spasmodic dysphonia may be doing. They don't tell you that the dosage is uncertain, that it's experimental by the top, the creme de la creme, and they're playing with the dosage, that there are serious consequences from the Botox shot for spasmodic dysphonia, that people are taking Botox, they go on a roller coaster ride in and out over a period of time. They lose their voice, they get some voice, hopefully they get a better voice. It lasts for a short while, they get another Botox shot. The same process continues for four to ten Botox shots or more each and every year for life. Yeah, and I'm assuming that your gripe with the New York Times is really more related to that if a marketing organization like Allergan Inc., for instance, or a Nonprofit organization like the National Spasmodic Dysphon Dysphon Dysphonia Association that gets generous do generous donations from Allergan. Mm -hmm. If they were making a statement like uh, uh, Robert McAllister did mm -hmm. not that long ago, mm -hmm. who that, is Robert McAllister? He's the f he's the former director, of executive the NSD, director of the National Spasmodic Dysphonia. This group he's gets money from Allergan. Yeah, his statement was made in USA Today mm -hmm. that Botox is a godsend and that it is uh, the cat's meow with respect to treating spastic, uh, spasmodic dysphonia. Mm -hmm. Now, you would expect a statement from McAllister like that to be taken for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Here, this guy represents an organization that gets heavily donate, heav heavy donations and yet pretends to be independent. Yeah, but the public the doesn't maker. know that the NSDA is getting donations of money from Allegan. Yeah, they, they don't know they the time. Know that. No, they don't. But do they know the public in looking at the New York Times, would you say that they would have every reason to believe that what they would read would be factual and accurate Absolutely. information? Absolutely. The New York Times is the gold standard. It has believability, credibility. It has, it has all the abilities. And when you read that statement, you go out and you get Botox. It has Botox. a lot of weight to it. I mean, it that's... It's more than a little weight or yeah. weight. It has authority. It has everything that a product could be sold. And the New York Times is saying to the audience and those to the public and the media and to uh, those with spasmodic dysphonia, this is the cure-all, this is the panacea. It implies that. Maybe it didn't mean that. But it's not talking about the qualifications, the reservations of the Botox and what it does to people. That's the issue involved. They're not giving full disclosure as to what Botox is doing for spastic vocal cords other than saying this is what you should do. And, and they're not a your, balanced your concern, story. Your concern about the New York Times is that they're giving false and misleading information. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I mean, it sounded to me like you, you're even wondering if the source would, they would not identify their source, that there perhaps there's a reason why they are refusing, like Miller refused, mm -hmm. to identify her source of the WMD in all her articles. And now the, the source, of course, of who outed Valerie Plame, the wife of Joseph Wilson, mm -hmm. ex-Iraq ambassador, that she's a secret, you know, that she's a covert CIA operative. That's the thing that may bring the White House down. But in your case, with the spasmodic dysphonia stuff, mm -hmm. all you wanted to get to the bottom is how could a writer who has no background in the mm -hmm. field of voice and speech pathology make a statement? Very concise. That Botox very, is giving very, patients. very apropos. It was in almost one like line. A, it was almost like a slogan. Botox it's an is infomercial. Gi this giving patients with spasmodic It's an ad. It sounds it's like an ad. It's endorsed by the full authority and guaranteed by the New York Times believability yeah. and credibility. That's yeah. what I'm finding. And you're wondering who the source was. Yes. I know the documentation is not relevant for the That he's for the provided statements. you. Yeah, that he provided me. Yeah. And this is So a have we caught the New York Times at another... Uh, and, I think and, it's and a so gaffe. Is it more mischief on the New York Times? Is this mischief in the sense that the source was a representative from the drug maker hmm. who basically has them make a statement that in increases 
drug sales and the marketing power of an article like that. Yes, I, I think that's what. Because none of the reservations were put in. No, that article. no, no, the reservations. It's a blithe statement, fully endorsed by the power and strength of the New York Times. That's and, what I'm finding fault, and it's not a balanced story. Yeah, and so the, the and the, they will not report cures of spasmodic dysphonia, although I've documented cures given them the names of the patients, the names of the doctors, yeah. and who is involved, and they can check, they can investigate. Like Peggy Aiken, who came to me, a representative from the NSDA, National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association, October 14, 2000. She told me, and I taped her with her permission, uh, for three hours, and she told me that she doesn't want me to report cures of spasmodic dysphonia. I've been reporting cures of spasmodic dysphonia by direct voice rehabilitation, all naturally, in 1974 at the American Speech and Hearing Association, my field, in 1979, 1980, and a month later in 2000 after she visited me on October 14, 2000, for three hours reporting cures. She didn't want me to report cures. The NSDA newsletter, National Spasmodic Dysphonic Newsletter, says that there are no cures, and they're looking to uh, unmask the medical cause, the neurological cause of SD. My position is that SD is not a medical problem. It's not a neurological problem. It's not a dystonia. It's not a disease. It's simply a misuse of the speaking voice, and I could not report ongoing cures of this condition where it a neurological problem, a medical problem, a disease, a molecular biological problem, a... Uh, a um, acid reflux problem, or any of the theories that medicine yeah. has, has, but never one cure since trial first described spasmodic dysphonia as nervous hoarseness in 1871. Well, I, I want to get back to the you know the connection mm. with the New York Times, and mm. because I, I think it's illustrating something that's a broader issue, you know, for people who are out there trying to dis to really. Uh, figure out whether there's accuracy in what they're hearing and what they're reading any longer. What you're bringing us, you're bringing to the attention, just as one example among many, and mm -hmm. I'm drawing your attention to on the WMD issue, is that inaccurate statements and misleading statements uh, were made that seem that seem to um, uh, reflect the uh, prerogative of a uh, organization that markets a product. This is a drug company that wants to get their product out to the market. And they have every right to do so. And you have no problem with that. No. But what you have a problem with is the front, uh, front that page That the New writer. York Times is endorsing it blithely without reservations and ignoring what I've been telling them in writing, that there's another side to the Botox story and the outcome, and that there are cures of the condition contrary to what the medical community, what Allegan, the maker of Botox, and the American Speech and Hearing Association guarantee Guarantee there are no cures, so I must be reporting cures of non-existent patients. Right. But these are documented cases diagnosed at UCLA Medical Center, Scripps, Cedars Sinai, the Mayo Clinic, and the list goes on. Now, do you believe that the New York Times, I mean, has been paid by the drug maker to uh, and assigned a reporter like Donald McNeil Jr., unbeknownst to Donald McNeil Jr., perhaps? that they've been assigned this because the uh, publisher of the New York Times, Arthur Sulzberger, receives a certain amount of money from the drug maker, Allergan. Do you believe that? No, not at all. Not one iota. Why? No. Because I, 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 I do not question their integrity. Um, I think they're, they're taking handouts from a drug company. Uh, they're taking handouts by a writer who doesn't know, uh, in a sense, what he's writing about. Do you about know who used saying, the word integrity? Mm-hmm. Do you remember who the last person that you said? You said you don't, you don't question their integrity. No. You know who Not said, on this issue. But I want to I tell you who made Not that exact same statement mm -hmm. was made by um, a, a guy named uh, Elias Zerhouni. Mm -hmm. Do you know who Zerhouni is? Yes, he's the, uh, he's the director of the National Institutes of Health. Now, he was asked if it bothered him mm -hmm. that his researchers, independent medical researchers, were taking a dual salary from drug companies and report and and did he think that that had any effect on the outcome of studies mm -hmm. that tended to support what the drug makers mm -hmm. wanted because his researchers are taking dual salaries from mm -hmm. the drug companies? Mm -hmm. He said the same thing. He said he believes he has the in the highest level integrity of his researchers. I don't believe uh, what he said. Uh, no, wait a valid. But you you don't believe in the in, the, in that, but you believe no. that in the highest level of integrity at the New York Times.
Why do you believe that they have more integrity than they, the National Institutes the, of Health? Because uh, they at the New York Times have a love of the medical paradigm. Uh, they believe in the medical profession. They do not allow themselves the possibility that a lone voice doctor with a Ph.D. and a track record to prove what he's saying there are cures of spasmodic dysphonia could possibly be right. They cannot believe that. It's a David versus Goliath. I'm the only doctor in the world reporting cures of spasmodic dysphonia. And all the medical websites, all the, the information on the Internet, per se, yeah. involving doctors and medical websites, guarantee there are no cures of spasmodic dysphonia. Arthur Salzberger, senior and junior, have every right to take the position that I must be out to lunch. But the problem is maybe they should look again and see if the medical community wait, you're not the issue is on the wrong right track. Dr. Cooper, take mm. Dr. Cooper aside, the, mm. the, you know, the, the non-physician going up against the Goliath mm. medical pharmaceutical establishment. Forget that for a second. We're only talking about a front page article mm. that makes a categorical statement that is unsupported by either documentation or by a reference mm. or a source. So that problem that you've identified with them goes to the heart of the credibility of their publication yes, it as, does. It's, as it's been exposed by Jason Blair, now Judith Miller and others, that your example is no different basically than the other major examples that the front page of that New York Times can be influenced by publicly traded corporations, for government sources that are deliberately infiltrating the paper with false and misleading information and the, it's like Maureen Dowd said, you know, Judith Miller said, well, everybody's saying, well, she was duped by the White House or by mm -hmm. Cheney's mm -hmm. office. And Maureen Dowd said, well, wait a second. You know, she could have asked a question. Shouldn't she check out the sources a little bit rather than accepting it lock, stock and barrel? Mm -hmm. Don't you think this, uh, the editors like Cochran and Bill Keller and others who work at the Times have a obligation? They do have it, but they're not taking that responsibility. Thank you, folks, for listening to Botox in the New York Times fascinating story yeah I mean you know I think these editors like Cochran here mm. who's deliberately obfuscating mm. by raising a statement a question mm. uh, that had nothing to do with what you asked them to no. check on no it's the same it, irrelevance well it's a making it red herring they're going to uh, yeah. another path which is fine uh, he's an editor he knows how to play games with the word I'm a clinician. I know how to help cure spasmodic dysphonia. I know what they're saying. The statement is uh, blithely wrong. It's not uh, But it qualified. wasn't the statement that you wanted him to investigate, which no, it's is not. why Botox, wh wh why uh, McNeil said that Botox is giving patients with spastic vocal cords back their voice.